Good morning, and I wonder how often at the moment you are trying to predict the future. You're trying to work out what's um, going to happen next, what's the next phase going to look like, the next stage, um, what are the might be's and the could be's and the plans ahead. And I wonder, are you exhausted by it like I am and everyone else seems to be? Because in all of that planning, there's inevitably disappointment, the frustrations and the, the sadness of things being postponed and not as we want them to be or as they were and... And what's going to happen? And as you think about that what's going to happen question, we come to Psalm 76 this morning. And I think it's a psalm that's really helpful in telling you what's going to happen. And it does that by, by singing a song about what God has done and what God will do. In verses 1 to 6 of this psalm, it's like looking in the revision mirror and looking back at this incredible deliverance that God has brought. And then in the second half, from verses 7 through to 12, it looks forward to an incredible judgment that will come and a God who's powerfully in control. In, in all of it, you discover um, what's going to happen. Well, like what happened in the past when you look in the revision mirror, you see God wins. When you look forward, you discover that God wins. He's ultimately and always in control. Psalm 76, as we arrive at it, is a song. And I want you to think about what kind of a song is this? I want to suggest it's a little bit like Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody, in that there's bits of it that, that are very lovely and soothing, but then there's bits that are kind of thunderbolts and lightning that's very, very frightening. In fact, literally, um, it, it depicts itself that way. So when you start this psalm, it's looking back on this great deliverance and it describes God and where he is and his renown. Look at verse 1. God is renowned in Judah. In Israel, his name is great. His tent is in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. This is where God is. Uh, th those references are very local. Uh, he's God in Judah, and the reference to Salem is a reference to Jerusalem. And, and there he is. He's in his tent. Um, literally, he, he goes on to talk about his dwelling place. It's actually in his lair. There's an echo here that it's like the lion in his den. Um, and there he is in Zion, God's holy mountain, where he reigns and rules victorious. And now it starts to build to the thunderbolts and lightning. Notice in verse 3, there he broke the flashing arrows and the shields and the swords and the weapons of war. This is a reminder that God's powerful. And then it gets more specific about the God who is powerful and uh, unapproachable. Look at verse 4, you are radiant with light, more majestic than the mountains, rich with game. The valiant lie plundered. They sleep their last sleep. Not one of their warriors can lift his hands. At your rebuke, God of Jacob, both horse and chariot lie still. It's probably a reference to the incredible victory that God had when the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, came against God's people. And God's people did nothing. And yet God sends out the angel of the Lord and overnight... 158,000 people lie at God's judgment and the, um, the archers can't even lift their arms to fire off an arrow. Uh, they can't even find their hands. You can read about this in Isaiah 37. There's this incredible victory that God brings and this psalm seems to echo that. Here's this miraculous restraint against this force of great power as Sennacherib and all of his forces come against Israel. And God shows himself to be victorious. Here is this great deliverance by the great deliverer. Verses 1 to 6. So look back and remember that. But now look forward. And what do you see? You see the depiction of a great judgment. It's a depiction of the future judgment that will come when Christ returns to judge all. And in that space, as he comes, it shows once again that God is victorious. It's actually described for us in these verses like it's already happened. They're all past tenses. Even yet it's describing a future event. And we actually find that often in God's word. It's called the prophetic past. So certain are the events that are yet to take place. They are written as if they've already taken place. It is you alone who are to be feared. Who can stand before you when you are angry? From heaven you pronounced judgment. And the land feared and was quiet. When you, God, rose up to judge, to save all the afflicted of the land, surely your wrath against mankind brings you praise. The survivors of your wrath are restrained. Notice the way that it's described. 
it, it asks the question, who can stand? Who will win? What's going to happen in the future? Well, it's, it looks like a great annihilation, like no one could possibly stand. And in fact, when you come to Revelation 6, it, it echoes exactly that same question. Then the kings of the earth and the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called out to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us! Hide us! from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can withstand it? Who can? Who could possibly, and this is what the psalmist is saying, who could possibly do it? God, when, when you come, you've pronounced your holy judgment and none of us can stand before. But as you read on in the book of Revelation, what the psalm says is also true, that when you come, to bring your wrath against mankind, it brings forth praise because you're also the one that brings salvation because judgment has come. Victory is here. Sin has been defeated and dealt with finally. But, but notice in all of that, that this God who comes in the certainty of this future judgment, there is a place to stand. And so the psalmist will say, how ought you respond? Verse 11, make vows. Make vows to the Lord your God and fulfill them. Let all the neighbouring lands bring gifts to the one who is to be feared. See, there's a refuge. There's one who's enthroned, who reigns, and he wins. And to be on his side is to be victorious. With all of the uncertainty and confusion about what the future is like and tomorrow and who's really powerful, Psalm 76 says God wins. He breaks the spirit of the rulers and he is to be feared by the kings of the earth. It's like that scene you get at the end of the song that's sung in Philippians chapter 2 after it speaks about Christ being humbled even to death and dying in our place. That God has lifted him up to the highest place and given him the name that is above every other name and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See that... Song in Philippians is saying that everyone, willing and unwilling, will declare that Christ is indeed the King, the one who is victorious and rules and reigns for all time. And this psalm does the same thing. Willing or unwilling, it's a psalm that calls for your submission. So keep the faith. Keep the vow. And bring the gift, your life that you've been given, into submission to him knowing that for all of the things that we might fear, if we fear him, we also know that we sit protected by this one who reigns and rules, the one who has ultimate power, and that is a splendid and glorious thing. And it's worth singing about, and it's worth taking refuge in today, knowing that God is still enthroned. And with that thought, God bless.